Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. My name is Norma Holland from the Office of Equity and Inclusion at the University of Rochester, and we thank you so much for joining us this midday. Um, we're really excited. Uh, we'll just give one more minute for folks to get on into the call, and uh, we will begin our program momentarily with Dr. Wanda Cooper, who we're so honored to have join us this afternoon. So we'll just wait one more beat, and then we'll get started. All right, let's get started then. And we'll we'll uh, give Dr. Cooper as much time as we can. We so appreciate her being here today. Uh, today we have a um, our second speaker in our 21 day equity challenge uh, that we have been having now daily challenge. Many of you have signed up to receive those emails and we're so excited and we appreciate that. Um, as part of our 21 day equity challenge, we offer these Friday lectures. And today we're gonna to be talking about burnout um, and how to invest in your wellness. Um, and today we have invited Dr. Wanda Cooper, a workplace consultant, owner of Cooper Productions, LLC, a consulting company dedicated to helping organizations with executive coaching, strategic planning, employee wellness and retention, um, and then framing their story of impact to enhance their funding opportunities. Storytelling is so very important to organizations. Um, but so is being able to be resilient and stay the course. Um, many of you who work in diversity, equity, and inclusion know how stressful this job can be, but maybe you just have a very stressful job in general, no matter where uh, you work. Um, so how do we build uh, that resilience and prevent the burnout? Dr. Wanda Cooper is here. We thank her so much for her time. Uh, and her talent and sharing it with us this afternoon. So we're going to go ahead and let you get started. One thing we will let you all know, uh, the presentation does take up quite a bit of time. So if you would like to ask Dr. Cooper a question, we will put her email in the chat and you can email her your questions and she will respond to them. And we are, again, very grateful for that uh, as well. Dr. Cooper, welcome. Hola, everyone. Thank you for your time. Um, and, and also thank you for your Commitment to to invest in your wellness. It's good to see familiar faces. Uh, uh, it's great to see as you're all coming in some very familiar faces. So um, I'm honored to share this space with you today, and um, we're going to get right into it. So um, I have I've worked just as a quick introduction by background. I've worked in a nonprofit uh, sector for over 25 years, and recently made the transition to higher education. I am passionate about creating work environments that promote and prioritize employee wellness. And if you've worked with me, you know that I've always uh, questioned, why are you not taking your time, right? Take the time off that you have worked so hard to, to accumulate. So I do see someone in this room that I've worked with previously. So I'm sure she will smile and know that I'm always sending people home when I see them stressed out. Um, so, uh, I conducted local research on the perceived factors of workplace burnout and mitigation strategies from the lens of frontline employees as part of my doctoral studies. So now I conduct workshops and presentations on ways to invest in your wellness. And I also consult leaders on seeking ways to create organizational cultures that values and promotes employee wellness. And in, all full, and in full transparency, I am still working on consistently, which is the key word here, consistently investing in my wellness. Wellness is a lifelong journey that we are all on. So this workshop is a call to action for all of us. Now, I also want to warn you that the first part of this presentation can be a little overwhelming as you learn about the impact of workplace burnout. But I encourage you to stay engaged during our time together, because today is meant to create a sense of urgency and encourage you to intentionally and consistently invest in your wellness, invest in your future. The best part is that you can prevent burnout and it's detrimental effects on your well-being. Do you guys remember the, the bear, only you could prevent forest fires? Well, you can prevent, you can decrease your, um, your possibility of being burnt out. 
So let's get started. So this is our agenda for today. We're gonna, um, we're not going over expectations, but the expectations is that you'll be engaged and that you'll take what's, uh, what you learn here and not put it on a shelf, but actually tell others about it and, and continue to use it as an investment for, for your own well-being. We'll talk about today's goal, causes, symptoms, and impact the burnout, and the road to prioritization. How will you prioritize your wellness? How will you start investing in your future? And then the wellness commitment will cover that as well. Today's goal, my goal, whenever I present, is very simple, and it's always the same goal. I want to move you from knowledge to action action that improves your quality of life and allows you to model the way for others. Action that is authentic, consistent, and fruitful. In 2022, the Building Movement Project, which aimed to understand the needs of nonprofit capacity builders, surveyed 800 nonprofit leaders and to find out, to find out what they needed to maintain and build their organizations. The top two responses were that leaders wanted help raising money, which if you're a leader, eh, I, you can understand that need. And then the second was addressing staffing issues, especially workplace burnout. So what we know is that employees are one of the most critical stakeholders because they are the strongest supporters and possibly the most critical, most vocal critics of the organization if they're in, if the internal policies do not meet their expectation. And I think we've all been in situations where we're in a, an organization that we don't quite feel connected to or that we don't quite feel sees us and values our wellness. I'm sorry, I'm trying to navigate through a couple of different screens here. All right. So that being said, we know that workplace stress remind, remains at a record high. About 52% of employees report are reporting a lot of stress. 52% is more than half. So this trend holds serious implications for your wellness, productivity, and longevity in your current employment, longevity in employment period. I want this uh, slide to marinate. I want this statement to marinate just for a couple seconds. When I um, ran across this quote, it hit me like a ton of bricks. And I was like, wow, you know, this is really what I've been, this is like the culminating phrase of all the, the research that I've done and all the work that I've really been doing to raise awareness on how to create organizational cultures that value employee wellness and also as individuals, how we invest in our wellness during within our working environments. So in the research shows that every 40 seconds, someone has a heart attack. So while we are on this Zoom, 90 people will suffer a heart attack. Heart attacks, cardiovascular disease are exacerbated by prolonged chronic stress. So I want you to understand that. This is where we're this is where we're starting to talk, right? This is this, these are the serious implications. But today you have to you have the power to choose you. You have the power to choose to invest in your future. That's why you're all here today. So let's talk about is burnout a buzzword? I mean, we have a lot of catchphrases. We had a, we have a lot of hashtags, especially a lot of hashtags that came out of um, the pandemic in relation to work quiet quitting was a huge one, right? So is burnout a buzzword? No, it isn't. In fact, the World Health Organization <clears throat> legitimized workplace burnout by adding it to the International Classifications of Diseases, ICD-911. So it's the 11th edition. It was categorized as an occupational phenomenon and this and defined as a psychological syndrome that results from unmanaged prolonged stress, specifically at work. So simply put, burnout is a state of physical, mental, and emotional exhaustion. It can happen in any profession, but it ha it, it's more prevalent in the helping professions. So let me take you back a little bit. About 13 years ago, in 2010, the Stress in America survey reported that high stress is a precursor to detrimental health consequences, and that almost 50%, 10 years ago, 
of adults had reported having physical effects from their stress. And that was 13 years before the pandemic. Today, we know that the number is now 52% that remain that, or that, I'm sorry, today we know that workplace stress remains at a record high of 52% of employees reporting a lot of stress at work. So this trend holds serious implications for our wellness. So what causes workplace burnout? Well, workplace burnout, workplace burnout specifically. A lack of procedural knowledge, not knowing how to do your job. What are the actual tasks to get to, from point A to point B? Or what are the actual tasks that I have to um, complete in order to meet my deliverable, in order to see success in my, in my role? Resources and, and accessibility. Resources, you'd be surprised how many times people um, start their, their employment, new employment, and they don't have all the resources that they need. They don't have all the supplies that they need. Sometimes they don't have a computer. Oh, that's on order, it'll be here in two weeks. Or sometimes they don't have proper um, office supplies. Sometimes the desk has been around probably long, just as long as the building has been around, right? So um, the desk could be very, very old, not functioning. It, it, it could just not be a, a good, it could not be conducive to getting the work done. Paper clips phone, I mean, you name it, every little thing, every little thing that you need to do your job has to be supplied for you and you have to have access to it, know how to access it. Where do I get the paper clips? How do I refill the paper to, for the copier machine? I know these things sound very simplistic, but imagine going to work every day and wondering, how am I gonna get my work done because I don't have the supplies or the resources to do it? Accessibility is also, um, when we speak about our leaders, is your leader accessible? When you're having a barrier, you're encountering, encountering a challenge, who do you turn to? Do you know what the process is? So it's, it's, so accessibility really is one of also the key drivers because when you encounter a barrier and you do not have the resources or you don't have um, your supervisor accessible to you or you do not know who to turn to, you're really stumped. People spend a lot of time frustrated. People spend a lot of time with high anxiety because they just don't have the simple um, supplies. They don't know who to turn to when they have a supply or a barrier challenge. So I would really encourage you when you start and when you start your employment or even now at your current employment to really understand how do you mitigate these in your at your organization. Unplug time away. How many people are working through lunch, sitting at their desk, working through lunch because they just have to get it done? That's not good, right? So unplugged time away is taking those breaks away from your computer, away from your main work area. You should go to the break room. There should be a place for you to go away, to um, be away from your main working area. It helps your brain adjust and it tells your brain it's time for rest. It's time to stop working. It's time to rest and recharge. So definitely unplug time away. Take your breaks, take your lunches. And then control and autonomy. We know that if you're not in a leadership position, you may have very little autonomy and control over the structures, the policies of your, of your role, as well as your um, organization. So as leaders, we need to understand how do we incorporate these um, transparent, bi-directional communication processes so that we can understand what our employees need and we can really work with them to start mitigating some of these issues. And as I stated um, with the World Health Organization, unaddressed chronic stress is a big component. If you are stressed every day at work for eight hours a day, 40 hours a week, sometimes 50 and 60, depending on how long you're working, Think about what that is doing to your body, your main organs, your brain, your heart, your lungs, your gut, your liver, your kidneys, all these main organs that are constantly working to get you to your optimal level, right? To keep you alive, to keep you going every day. And then unreasonable demands. Um, if you are hired for a 40 hour job and it's really 60 hours worth of work, 
those are unreasonable demands. So that's that's a workload equity issue. Okay, so these are the factors or these are the causes of burnout. The symptoms of burnout are physical and psychological. Cardiovascular disease is a, is, is a big one. And I just told you that in our time together, 90 people will experience a heart attack. That's so, that, that always hits home when I say it. 90 people in the next hour will experience a heart attack. Respiratory issues, sleep disturbances. Imagine being so stressed out. You can't sleep. Your brain cannot shut off, right? And then extreme fatigue. Now, my concern about the extreme fatigue is that there's a ripple effect. So you're exhausted at work, you get home. What do you think is gonna happen when you get home? More than likely, you're gonna be disconnected from your household um, unit, right? So let's say you have kids, so say you have a partner, you go home, you're so exhausted, you can't even connect with them. You're not physically, mentally there. So they, So there are ripple effects to workplace burnout. It will affect your network because you will not be able to be fully engaged in that network. Psychological symptoms are anxiety, depression, low self-esteem, and believe it or not, PTSD. Imagine, even if you think about um, our armed forces, right? Uh, they're under chronic stress and a lot of them come home with PTSD. And that is a result of unmanaged chronic stress. So I'm here to tell you that workplace burnout can also cause PTSD. The impact of burnout, it's a livelihood impact. As you can see from this slide, unaddressed stress impacts the quality of your life. So think about when you're burnt out or when you are feeling extreme fatigue, you're exhausted emotionally, physically, um, your absenteeism is gonna increase, your dissatisfaction, your, your, your Poor health will increase. There's even violence in the workplace that can take place uh, when someone is experiencing burnout. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on in the, in the um, presentation. And then financial hardships. If you're not going to work, it's going to impact your financial, um, it's going to impact your financial, uh, financial wealth. And then interruptions and goal attainment. Again, you're not going to be present. You're going to be, you're going to have high absenteeism. You're going to have a lot of starts and stops. And so it will interrupt your goal attainment um, process. And then there's going to be a decrease in your productivity, your self-efficacy, and your self-efficacy is really your, your belief in your ability to successfully complete a task, to successfully meet a goal. And then your problem solving is probably going to decrease as well. Earnings over your lifetime, again, financial hardships. You're probably going to go through numerous employers. You're probably going to um, also see that increase in absenteeism and that decrease in earning over your lifetime and promotional opportunities. If you're calling in sick, if you're seen as disengaged, you're probably not gonna be the one that they call when there's an opportunity uh, or a promotional opportunity. So research shows that even if stress that we're experiencing does not produce burnout, it's still highly toxic to our health because it increases the chance for long-term illnesses. Furthermore, MRI scans and psychological measurements concluded that the neural circuits in your brain are altered when people experience burnout, which causes an inability to control negative emotions. So there it is. When you're burnt out, you cannot control your negative emotions. So you may have an outburst at work, right? You may even have a physical reaction. And when I was talking about violence, that violence could be in, it could be you. It could be you damaging um, the copier at work that never works, right? <laughs> How many of us have pounded on the copier? Oh, you just have to hit it a couple of times and then it starts working. How many of us have pounded on the printer out of frustration, right? And so burnout is proven to cause an inability to control your negative emotions. And studies also show that there is a correlation between burnout and physical changes to the amygdala and cortical thinning, leading to decreased fine motor functions. So not only is, are the neural circuits in your brain being altered, but also physical changes to your amygdala and, and there's cortical thinning of the brain is also leading to decreased fine motor, fine motor functions. And so 
when I talk about violence in the workplace, it's, in, it's also important to understand that bullying exists in the workplace. And it also has significant implications. Studies show that employees are being exposed to verbal and physical abuse in the workplace. And I will also say for people of color, our black and brown people are experiencing violence through macro and micro aggressions. And I know that I believe day three, um, the 21 day equity challenge sent out a lot of information about microaggressions. So I want you to be very conscious of bullying is not just someone being overtly violent, overtly um, verbally abusive, but it's also those, those, those um, microaggressions that you're sitting there going, did she just say, did he just, and then we internalize those feelings. And because microaggressions are not necessarily tangible, where you can point it out, and it's still, uh, I would say, vague in the workplace when we're, we're acknowledging it, this is something to really pay attention to. And with 45% of employees experiencing bullying in the workplace, we must be advocates. No, let me rephrase that. We must demand safe working environments especially because the research shows that bullying can cause higher risk of cardiovascular disease. I just told you about, you know, every, every 40 seconds, someone has a heart attack. That is cardiovascular disease at its finest, right? And so we need to make sure, we need to make sure that we are arming ourselves with data, with advocacy and demanding safe, physical and psychological work environment. So how do we combat burnout? Everyone has their reason for being here today. And I wanna challenge you to not place what you've learned so far on a shelf when we part ways. If you're a leader, a mentor, an advocate, a parent, a daughter, a sister, you're modeling the way for others. There's a saying that you must teach people how to treat you and that applies to the workplace too. Your investment in your well-being, in your future, does not stop, should not stop when you enter your place of employment. So, so far, we've learned about the factors of burnout, symptoms, and the impact. Now let's move from knowledge to action. Let's review actionable ways to invest in our wellness. Our first action is to reflect and conduct an assessment. We need to understand what we are telling our brains. So let me give you a, an example. The Buddha was asked, what is the difference between liking and loving myself? And he responded with this story. He said, when we like a flower, we pluck it. We put it in a vase and we admire it. But eventually it dies because it's removed, it's plucked from its life source. And not much goes into its longevity or its progression. We may add aspirin to lengthen its life, but eventually it withers away and dies. But when we love a flower, we invest in its nourishment. And, and, and I'm, I have a lot of plants in my home and I talk to my plants. I make sure their soil is healthy. I add water. I make sure it has ample sunlight to grow. And that is what the Buddha was talking about. He said, we make sure the soil is healthy. We water it. We put it in a perfect place where it can get ample sunlight and space to grow. Sometimes we, we transfer it from one pot to the other because it's getting so large, it needs room to grow, right? It's outgrowing its space. And, and we may even rotate it, right? Possible po The possibility of the entire flower getting sunlight and nourishment. So simply put, he concluded, we love When we love something, we intentionally invest in its growth and progress. We consistently show up. So I want you to reflect on what your current wellness strategies are demonstrating. Is it that you like yourself? You're, you're in a vase and you're going you're gonna to leave yourself there and eventually wither away? Or do you love yourself? And you're going to make sure that soil that you've planted yourself in is healthy. You're gonna make sure that that soil is giving you nutrients, nourishing you for your long-term progression and growth. Better yet, are you investing in yourself? 
with that same ferocious intensity that you invest in others. Let that sit for a minute. Are you investing in yourself with that same ferocious intensity that you invest in others? So after reflecting on what we're saying to our brains, we move on to the second action, which is focus on the importance of managing our yeses. As we seek balance in our lives and intentionally lower our stress and prevent burnout, we need to understand how full our plates are. So I'll ask you, do you still have room on your plate or is your plate full? How do you know? It takes intentionality to understand our level of capacity. It takes reflection, constant reflection, to understand our capacity. How much more can I do? How much more can I take on? Do we have time for something else? So often we say yes without thinking about how much time our yes will take, right? Um, in the moment, you either feel flattered and you're like, absolutely, I can do that. Or you don't know how to say no. You feel bad for saying no. Right? Or you just think, man, this is one of my real good colleagues, real good friends. I have to do it. I have to do it. But how will you fit it in? Do you need to remove something in order to fit it in? As well as what additional resources will you need to be successful? So best-selling author Greg McEwen wrote that to discern what is truly essential, we need space to think and the discipline to apply a highly selective criteria to the choices we make. One of the key takeaways of this statement for me is the intentionality of designing a criteria for my time and disciplining myself to stick to that criteria. How disciplined are we with our yeses? So I would encourage you to stop and ask. This is my checklist and I'll share it with you. What is the time commitment? What resources will I have access to? What will I remove from my place, my plate? And I don't say yes right away. I take at least 24 to 48 hours to access, assess my capacity. So research shows now that setting and adhering to boundaries helps lower stress and anxiety level. And that saying no to work is a, not a sign of weakness. It's the brain's way of saying it's time to recover. So when you're saying, so when you have a criteria for your yes, when you set boundaries and you adhere to them, you're telling your brain that, you, that your time is valuable. That although you may be an expert, your time is valuable and you need to really think about how this will affect you with, when it comes to your stress and anxiety levels. Because it's great to help, right? It's great to be part of your community and give back to your community, but not at the cost of your health, physical or psychological. So without a criteria, or a mental checklist, you may be setting yourself up for some serious consequences. Let's move on to our third action step. Oh, no, that's not it. Yes, it is. All right. So after creating a yes checklist, we really need to think about what is the wellness commitment that we're making for ourselves? And let's review some ways that we can do this. So we know that unaddressed chronic stress causes medical issues. We need to make sure that we are seeing our doctor. My uh, father passed away about a year and a half ago. And he, and it could have been prevented. But because he didn't go to the doctor, because he didn't take time to take his symptoms seriously, when he did finally go to the doctor, unfortunately, his cancer had already um, got into a stage where they could do preventive uh, interventions, but they were not able to cure him. As a matter of fact, he ended up with two different types of cancer as he progressed through his um, journey. Go see your doctor. 
Um, it taught me a valuable lesson. Losing my, my father, my biggest cheerleader, taught me a valuable lesson that I should not take for granted that I'm alive today, that my heart is beating, that I have air in my lungs, that I'm hungry and I, and I wanna eat, right? Um, that I'm thinking about what I'm gonna have for lunch after this presentation. Those are all things that I, I took for granted. But after my father's um, journey and after his death, I realized that, wow, I have a lot of work to do when it comes to committing to my wellness, to practicing what I'm teaching, to really being consistent. Many of us, our bodies will tell us when something is wrong and we push it away. I'll tell you another story. There was a young lady, and I say young lady because she was in her 40s. And that's young to me. Um, I'm 51, so 40 is ooh, very young. <laughs> but my, um, so this young lady uh, was experiencing abdominal discomfort. And she was experiencing this discomfort probably for about three, four days. And she kept saying, oh, ah, I'm not feeling well, but just, ah, it's nothing, it's nothing. Well, she ended up having a heart attack. And she did not recover from that heart attack at 40 because she didn't listen to her body because she put work before listening to her body because she could not see herself taking time off of work to go check out, to go to the doctor to find out what was happening with her. See, she put work before her own wellness. And what we all know is that although you're valuable to your job, and I'm not saying your organization doesn't care about you, but what we all know is that if you pass away today, your job will be posted and your replacement will be sought. So I tell you, put your wellness before your job. See your doctor when your body is telling you that something is not right. Never hesitate to seek professional support. When you're, feel, when you're not feeling your best. So it's either a medical doctor, a therapist, a faith leader, and oh, by the way, employee assistance program that all employers have, and that is the most underutilized, <clears throat> the most underutilized resource. A lot of us have trust issues and many of them are warranted. But I will tell you that employee, the employee assistance program is highly confidential. And I encourage you to seek out this free resource from your employee, from your organization. They will help you also find resources in the community. So it is a, a, a great opportunity for you to understand what resources are out for you, are out there for you so that you can address the ailments that you may be experiencing. Strive to drink 72 ounces of water. Water is your best friend. Um, it used to be eight ounces, eight cups, eight ounces a day. Well, now they upped it to nine cups, eight ounces a day. And I'll tell you, when I have felt my, uh, the most, when I have been at the height of my stress and I have downed an ice cold glass of water, it has helped me reset myself. So I encourage you to utilize water as some of one of your coping mechanisms. Water will help you hydrate your body, but it'll also help you hydrate your brain. I'm a coffee drinker, and I was shocked to hear that one cup of coffee in the morning will take five cups of water to um, hydrate you from that one cup of coffee. So if you're, a, if you're a coffee drinker, if you drink caffeine in the morning, whether it's coffee or soda, whatever caffeine you consume in, in, throughout the day, just know that you will have to drink a lot of water to combat that, right? To keep yourself hydrated, keep your organs hydrated, keep your brain hydrated. So when, so do not you do, do not look at the number three step like really, Wanda. Drink water, absolutely, absolutely drink water. Now the fourth one I always get pushed back from. Aim to dedicate thirty minutes three times a day towards your health and well being. An hour and a half a day. Just for myself, I don't have time, Wanda. I can't do that. I'll tell you what, an hour and a half a day is nothing, nothing for your longevity, right? For your wellness. You're investing in your wellness so that you can have a bright future. So think about what you're doing in order to really invest in that. 
And so I've even made it easier for you. Let's start with 15 minutes and work up to 30 minutes three times a day. Commit to daily relaxation and um, reflection techniques. That could be praying, breathe, deep breathing, and mindful um, deep breathing exercises, stretching, speaking affirmations. I'm going to tell you, I look in the mirror every morning and I hype myself up. I know it sounds funny, but I always say, girl, you got it today. Mm -mm. Can't nobody see you today. You about to eat it all, all day long, right? I hype myself up every morning. My husband laughs at me, but now he's doing it too. But anyways, my husband laughs at me. Anybody that hears me, if you're, if you're in my house in the morning, you're like, what is she doing in there? I'm hyping myself up. I'm telling me, I'm telling my brain that I love myself, that I bring value, that I am worthy, that nothing that anyone could say is going to tell me, is going to replace what I feel about myself. So hyping myself up in the morning is my way of having those daily affirmations. So find a way to really think about how are, what, how are you training your brain to really think about your day as a positive day as well as how you walk into that day. So the other thing is journaling is a great example of getting your feelings out, getting your stress out of your brain, out of your major organs and putting it on paper. Exercising, crafts, hiking, family QT time. I've had a lot of moms tell me, Wanda, I have young kids at home and they don't leave me alone. I can't even go to the bathroom in peace. And I'm like, okay. So why don't we have family quiet time? We can be models for our, for our networks and really model the way for them to start investing in their wellness. So if we have family wellness time every night, that means everyone is taking 20, 30 minutes to do what they what makes them feel good. It could be reading a book, it could be drawing, it could be listening to slow jazz music, it, whatever it is that your family wants to um, utilize as their wellness, that is how you start building that practice within your network. And that, and trust me when I tell you, that will also ripple to their networks. When um, my granddaughter was two years old, uh, she was crying one day and my daughter was like, you need some alone time. She took her and she put her in her room. I couldn't believe it. I was like, <gasps> Wow, how can you do that to the baby? Why are you, <laughs> how can you tell the two-year-old she needs time alone to put her in the room? And she said, mom, she's got to learn how to cope. She's got to learn how to, you know, take care of herself in these moments. And she's got to learn how to get her, relax herself again. And I was like, oh my goodness, this is, this is a little too much. But let me tell you, at three years old, my granddaughter, and she's 12, she'll be 12 in April. She still does this. She was able to verbally communicate that she needed time alone. She would tell us, I need some time alone. I need some time alone. And she would go to her room and then come out maybe 10, 15 minutes later. And what, I mean, I was just, I, I, I was so proud of my daughter because I didn't understand it in the moment, but I'm like, wow, a three-year-old understanding coping mechanisms, how, understanding how to take care of herself when she is being triggered or when she is experiencing stress. So there are very simple ways that you can make sure that you are incorporating your wellness um, strategies in your network and modeling the way for them. We need to set, like we discussed earlier, we need to set firm, consistent boundaries. We need to protect our peace and time. Not everyone is worthy of your time. I'll say that again. Not everyone is worthy of your talent, of your time or your treasure. Protect your peace and your time. Establish your criteria for your yeses. And remember that no is absolutely a complete sentence. You do not have to get into, you do not have to give people a reason why you can't do it unless you want to. A lot of times we come in and go, oh, I'm sorry, but I can't. And we come in with this guilt and that guilt we internalize it and we keep it and we walk around with it like, man, if I could have just done that for Norma, man, if I could have just done that for Dr. Strong, man, if I could have just, right? But we internalize that feeling and we keep it right in all of our internal organs. 
So please remember that not everyone is worthy of your time, talent, and treasure. We also need to minimize our use of alcohol and other drugs to relax. If you are drinking a glass of wine and you're telling yourself, I'm gonna relax with this glass of wine, I'm here to tell you that, don't do that. I'll tell your brain that you need a stimulant to relax. Everything that we do is a message to our brain. Everything that we say is a message to our brain. So I want you to really think about how your that self-talk that, that happens internally whenever something happens, okay? Start talking positively about yourself and start reframing situations. If you have a situation that you feel yucky about, that stresses you out, let's try to reframe that and think about how you can show up differently the next time you have maybe that same situation. Take your vacation and sit sick time. Ooh. I know many people that have 100 or more hours of personal time off. And I've heard them say, well, I have 200 hours. Well, I have you know, over 100 hours. And I'm like, why? Why? Take your time. You deserve that. You've earned it. Your PTO is not given free. You earn that PTO, right? It accrues. That means you are investing in that accrual. So let's, let's normalize taking vacations. Let's normalize not going to work sick. And then the other piece is when you're not working, we need to either take those notifications off of our work-related apps or ask for a separate work phone. And not just assume, not just you know, put everything on your personal phone. Because the great thing about having a work phone is that you can always turn it off and put it away. If for some reason you need to put it on your personal phone, I would always adjust those notifications. Okay. Remember, you want unplugged time away. And if you are not do not minimizing those notifications, then you absolutely will continue. Your brain, then you're not unplugging yourself, even if you're on vacation. And I tell you, for a long time, even on vacation, I checked my work email, I responded to work emails. So I was training my brain to always be on the ready, always be working. And then when I tried to wean myself off of that, I felt so guilty. And I also felt like, oh my God, I got I have to be doing something. So again, remembering that you do not have to be at work 24 seven. That's actually very detrimental to you. And when I say be at work, it's either physical or it's either mental, okay? <clears throat> and again, if nothing else, show up for yourself with that same ferocious intensity that we show up for everyone else. A lot of times we're willing to go to bat for those we love and advocate and you know just be this ferocious advocator. And we do that seamlessly and without even thinking for everyone else but ourselves. Think about a time where you showed up for someone else. Think about what went into it. When you show up for others, it takes a lot out of you, right? Emotionally, mentally, physically. So think about what you're taking away from you, from yourself, from your well being when you're telling your brain that everyone is more worthy, more important, and you can use, utilize your, your time to advocate for them, to take care of them, but you do not do that for yourself. Again, what are you telling your brain? Our fourth action, and this is the last action, it's hard to muster up, right, a positive outlook, which fuels our motivation and well-being. There's so much divisiveness in our country. There's so much on the news that are, are not positive um, stories. So it's very, it's very difficult to stay positive in our society today. And when we lose our positivity, burnout and fatigue can quickly follow. So a study comparing people who journaled their responses to these prompts that you see here on this slide found that over a 10 month period of time, they were not only happier, but physically healthier. I mean, 
Isn't that, isn't that great? Talk about the return of investment. Journaling, these, the top three, the, the last one I added, and I'll tell you why, but journaling these top three questions every day can make you happier and physically healthier. That's a guarantee. The research shows it. The studies show it time and time again. You can literally inject positivity and optimism into your day with this five minute exercise. So each morning, these questions, the I will focus on helps you carve out some of the will do's out of the endless could or should do's. The I am grateful for helps you reflect on your blessings versus your troubles. And I will tell you that when you can go back and look at your journal and look at all of the gratitude that you've journaled, it is a boost of positive energy. I, I, I smile just thinking about my journal and thinking about going back and reflecting and looking at everything that I'm grateful for. And I look at, I look at those, especially when I'm having a hard day especially when I'm feeling unmotivated or when I see a story on the news that is devastating or when I hear of someone uh, health or, or physical or mental health being impacted because of chronic stress, right? I look at what I'm grateful for. It's such a, a I'm telling you, it's a boost that I feel each and every time. The I will let go of helps you name it and release it. Sometimes we have things that are troubling us that we just can't put our fingers on. And sometimes when we're journal and through this journaling practice, you can really identify what that is. And it helps you when you name it, you can see it, you can put a name to it, you can categorize it, and you can see it when it happens again, right? It helps you really think about, wow, okay, it, here goes that thing, here goes that thing and it helps you release it. And the last question will help you begin to form your daily investment habits. Remember I said 30 minutes, three times a day. If that's too much for you, start with 15 minutes. What are you gonna dedicate 15 minutes to? And I'm not talking about scrolling on TikTok or Instagram or, hey, or Facebook. I'm not talking about going on social media. I'm saying, what are you gonna spend 15 minutes with just you? What is Wanda going to do with Wanda? Is there something that I need to talk to myself about, right? Is there an affirmation that is not working for me? I don't necessarily believe, but I say it every morning. In time of reflection, in these 15 minutes, while you reflect, you can learn so much about yourself. When you intentionally invest, there's a that reflection period. It's, oh. It's just a wonderful thing. And you can learn so much about yourself. You can learn where you're having difficulty naming and releasing it. You can learn where you're having difficulty really seeing, you know, those blessings and being grateful. And you could also learn how you're carving out your time, your time management. What are what am I spending my time on? I um while I was doing my doctoral research, I, I did a, a mini experiment on myself and I literally wrote down what I did throughout a week. And um, I spent more time helping others and um, being present at, at, at my employers and my employer than I did being present at home, being present for Wanda and investing in Wanda's wellness. So what I was role modeling for those that I care about, those I mentor and those I lead was that I was not worthy enough or I did not see worth in my wellness. I was constantly going, going, going. And I had to really say, wow, I'm being a hypocrite. I'm telling everybody to take care of themselves, but I'm not doing it. So I had to really sit with that. And I had to really tell myself, okay, what am I doing here? So it helped me really start carving out time for myself. It helped me learn what I'm grateful for. It helped me let go of some of those insecurities as well as the internalized um, effects of microaggressions. And it really helped me design a plan on how I was going to invest on my, in myself and my wellness 
daily. So that consistent daily investment. Ultimately, we're only awake for an average of 1,000 minutes a day. And that sounds like a lot, but 1,000 minutes, it's really not a lot. If we can invest five minutes of optimism every morning, that means we take control of the remaining 995 minutes. So I'd rather carve out five minutes to inject optimism into my morning so that I can control, so that I can continue to invest and enjoy those 995 minutes of the day. So it's time to really stop running on fume. Remember, you cannot give what you don't have. You're kidding, you're, you're, you're tricking yourself to saying, oh, I am just killing it. I'm investing in everybody, I'm mentoring, I'm leading, I'm doing all these wonderful things. But you might be doing them on fumes. So what are you really investing? What are you really modeling? So in conclusion, you, if you don't remember anything else that we discussed today, remember this. If you don't take time for your wellness, you'll be forced to take time for your illness. Thank you for your time and engagement today. My hope for you is that today is the beginning of your consistent investment towards your wellness and your future. God bless you. Thank there. you so much, Dr. Cooper. We so appreciate um, these so these super important reminders about um, taking care of ourselves. And you know, I'm reminded that during the pandemic, uh, the phrase self care was something we heard a lot about, and everyone was self care this and self care that. And um, I, I, you know, wanted to figure out where that even phrase came. Where did that come from? You know, I, I didn't grow up hearing that phrase. You know, my mother worked in an automotive factory for, for 25 years. I never heard Lucy Holland say anything about self-care. For her, self-care was coming home from the factory and turning on Oprah, you know, and having <laughs> her Winston cigarette, which wasn't good for her, the Winston, but, you know, it was the 80s. So look, but 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 again, I found out Audre Lorde, poet, famous poet, um, and, you know, um, just an amazing woman of her time came up with that. That was a phrase that she came up with. So, mm -hmm. um, but thank you. And I know that we've got, and I wanted to, and Emily, if you could share um, Dr. Cooper's email in the chat uh, for all, uh, for everyone in the meeting to, um, to reach out to you with any sort of question. Maybe I could ask you a question though. Um, you know, we feel a lot of guilt about taking the time. I know you said it is an imperative um, but we feel a lot of guilt about taking the time out for ourselves. Um, and it's not, you know, women especially, but but parents, I feel that extremely strongly, right? Um, because I feel like I need to be there for my child at all times. Um, so I love what your daughter did about, you know, asking the child to take the time out and sort of and now the child has internalized it. How do you overcome that guilt mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. that we feel? Um, you know, who am I to take time off, right? Who am I to do that? Uh, and what if I don't have something that, you know, I want to do necessarily? What if I just want to sit in silence? <laughs> that feels so selfish, you know? Yeah, so society has has uh, trained us, right, to to have that very, um, that, that feeling of I'm being selfish. Mm -hmm. uh, I should be doing something for others. And yes, there's a time for that. But the reality is that when you look at the data, when you look at the studies, when you look at what burnout does or what stress does to your major organs, you cannot afford not to take time for yourself. Sure. The reality is that we can, we can, we can serve and we can put others before us, but we're not modeling the way. What we're telling others also is that they're not important enough to take time to take care of themselves. The only way that we can continue to do the work that we're doing in our community, especially DEI work, is to take time for reflection, is to understand how our how or what our bodies need in order to continue that fight, in order to continue to, to give to others, in order to continue to show up. 
we must take daily time to pour back into us. And the reality is that that feeling of guilt is, is, is something that we have to work through. We have that self-talk is really part of that letting go of that feeling. What you're telling yourself is exactly what the behaviors that you will display and what your body will um, react to. So it's a story that we're telling ourselves and we need to learn to retell it. <clears throat> so I know that a lot of people on this call are people who may work in uh, you know, um, a clinical space. And so they may be doctors, they may be nurses, they may be clinicians, they may be you know, patient care techs, whatever, what have you, or you work with the population that needs you, okay? Um, and we saw, we have seen burnout. We've seen doctor, you know, physician burnout, clinician, caregiver burnout, caregiver burnout, Ooh, caring for someone at home, maybe with a, uh, you know, a, a, a long-term illness, yeah. Alzheimer's disease, yeah. you know, look, that takes a lot out of you. So yeah. for them, the, the, the time away and the, and the self-care and the caring for oneself is not just about, um, taking care of yourself, but if you're not, then you're not there for the other people. Uh, some people though, feel that the, the need to, to do so may even hold them back. Like what if I, I need to keep going or I'm not going to move in my career. I got to keep going. I got to keep going. If I don't, I'm never going to write that paper. I'm never going to get recognized or I'm never going to, you know. Yeah. You may not get recognized because you'll be, you know, dead. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's the reality. I, I hate to be so blunt, but this is critical information. Sure. And we've had, we saw in the pandemic that there were a lot, that there were um, helping professions where people were committing suicide, yeah. right? Because they could not hold on, they just couldn't carry that burden of the trauma that they were going through and the trauma that they were exposed to. Sure. So it is critical that we find ways to really reflect daily and to bring ourselves down from that 10. So let's think about the continuum number, you know, uh, on the on the sliding scale of one to 10, one is that you are good to go. You're even keel. And then number 10 is that you're highly stressed. When you stay at a 10, your body is working 10 times harder, right? And your brain is constantly going. That's not good for your body. That's not good for your, um, for your wellness. So the reality is that you may feel guilty about it, but it's either invest in the front end or be forced to take care of yourself in the back end. I always, my father is a salesman and he always says to me, honey, uh, <clears throat> nothing's for free. Amen to that. Amen to that. Nothing's for free, honey. Yes. We all pay. We all pay. So Dr. Cooper, thank you so much. I want to thank you for being here to our, our, our visitors, our guests, our participants today. Thank you so much. Don't forget, you can email Dr. Cooper at Cooper Productions with a Z in the end at gmail.com. Uh, she um, is in our community. She's been a longtime servant, and we're so grateful for your time and your talent and sharing your treasure with us. Uh, I want to your invite pleasure. you. Uh, next week, we have another wonderful speaker. If you go to urmccelebrates.com, you'll find out more there. And uh, later on today, we'll have video links of all of our presentations on there. So you can watch them if you missed the first one or uh, you want someone to watch today's presentation, you can check it out there. And don't forget to sign up for our final Friday speaker next Friday, Talithia Best from YMCA. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful afternoon and a fantastic weekend. I'm going to go do some resting right now, Dr. That's Cooper. right. Take care, everyone. Have a great right. Super Bowl weekend. That's right. <laughs> awesome. Woohoo! <laughs>